Welcome everyone to um, to our study. Um, could someone just could someone just um, let me know if you can actually hear? Just checking. Is the sound all right? Yes. Okay. Good. Excellent. Good morning, La. Okay. Excellent. Okay. Good. So, um, so we're presently studying Jamgun Mivar Rinpoche's Sherbaretti, Sword of Wisdom. And um, as always, we begin with generating the intention of wishing to establish all sentient beings at the level of perfect enlightenment. And um, we are doing that effectively through this present study which will serve as the inspiration and motivator and clarifier for our practice of the path. So we begin also with supplicating Jamgun Mipan Rinpoche. Through the blessing of awareness emptiness, Manjushri Kumara, you opened the expanse of wisdom and its eight minds of confidence, thus mastering the great treasuries of transmission and realization. Mipam Manjushri Gosha, I supplicate you. So in the text, we are presently looking at dependent arising. This seems to be coming up a lot these days in the various, in the various studies that we're doing. It says here, no matter how things appear, they arise interdependently. Nothing independent appears. That would be like a lotus appearing in the sky, which would be a lovely thing, but it's essentially referred to here as a hallucination, not something that's real. And basically it would mean something impossible. And that is the implication of dependent arising. We shouldn't just take that as face, at face value, but we should really investigate the, the, uh, the nature of, um, of the Buddha's teaching in this regard is very much that this is something that we should um, we should verify for ourselves, and of course the whole you say thrust or theme of this text is what we call valid cognition. It is about us asserting the validity of our knowledge. Oh, I'm okay. Sound is good. Someone's saying it went frozen. Okay, sound should be good. As you notice, I have a, a substantial microphone here. Some very, somebody very kindly provided this equipment, which I'm very grateful for. So it should actually improve the, the sound, certainly in the recording. This should be evident, but also now. Okay, so we're looking at, let's just go over what it says here. Well, let's start with Glorious Chandra Kirti, who says, that which arises as dependent and related is defined as coming together and connecting. So the essence of interdependence. So second, the essence of interdependence is that all phenomena, both outer and inner. And what we're going to look at here actually is, or are two aspects of dependent arising. One is the dependent arising as we can observe it in terms of the phenomenal world. And that's along the lines of what natural sciences does. It investigates how things exist. And this is where we particularly going to identify how everything actually exists on the basis of coming together, connecting, and essentially what we call interdependence or dependent arising. So all these phenomena, both outer and inner, do not arise without a cause. Things do not arise from a cause that is some other permanent creator, such as the Atman time or an almighty god like Ishvara. These are not causes. Excuse me. So these are not causes. This is of course what a lot of us possibly might have struggled with in our early years when we were saying, well, you know, everything was created in seven days and so forth, which is a lovely story, but it's just a little bit hard to identify exactly what we're talking about here, namely actual causation. How exactly would that happen? So that's where we then say here, things 
arise based on the coming together of their own interdependent causes and conditions. And so they are said to be interdependently arising. And of course, what's also implicit here is that anything that is a cause, that in itself is a product. So if we have, and we're going to be looking at rice seeds a fair bit, um, if you have a rice seeds, which gives rise to the sprout, that of course also in and of itself is something that came about due to, to various interdependent causes and conditions. Now we're going to introduce a a really wonderful sutra, I think I mentioned this last time, um, and it's called the Salu Jangbe Do in Tibetan or the Salistamba Sutra in Sanskrit. It's translated in 84,000, and I'll, I'm just going to actually sort of introduce you a little bit to 84,000, or at least the sutra as it sort of sits in the reading room of 84,000, in case you're not familiar with this. But the main focus here is this particular sutra. And that is where we then talk about outer interdependence. The sutra talks about outer interdependence, which is then the um, the outer phenomena, and then the um, and then actually our how we came into existence. You know, where do I come from, mommy? That sort of thing. How did it all begin? What takes place? So that's where we talk about the twelve links of dependent arising. We'll just have a, a light a light discussion on this topic. But I would say, I would, if ever you want to see a classic presentation of this and really very much in the, you could say, spirit of a um, sutra that is, is, not, is not all that long, and it's actually very interesting. So if we have, I would say, before we go, you go to that sutra, you want to have a little bit of familiarity, which you're getting here. Um, on its own, might be a little bit of a, a, you could say, a difficult topic to to um, engage with if it's the first time. But once you have some some idea of what it's about, and I th last time we looked at how this sutra uh, originated in terms of um, um, Shariputra requesting Maitreya to ex explain a little bit what the Buddha had said. Um, but on the basis of that, it really provides such a beautiful um, unraveling of this theme. So there's two categories, so categories of interdependence. So first, the outer one, the outer world. So there are two categories of interdependence, outer and inner. All outer phenomena arise interdependently, like a sprout arising from a seed. Inner phenomena, like the 12 links of interdependence, arise for all the aggregates of superior, average, and inferior sentient beings. I'm not exactly sure what is meant here with superior, average, and inferior sentient beings. We very often speak about, um, we very often speak about in terms of the path, those that you could say have are challenged with, you could say greater or lesser obscurations. Um, but here I'm not quite sure what, what is meant with these three categories. Um, anyway, the commentary on the Salu Sprout Sutra. And this is Anne Helm's translation then of the uh, Salu, Salu, uh, the, um, the Salistamba Sutra. The, uh, actually in English it's called the, the, um, the rice seedling. The rice seedling, that's how they translated it. The commentary on the, on the Salu Sprout Sutra teaches outer interdependence in more detail through the example of a sprout coming from a seed which has seven aspects related to the cause and six aspects related to the conditions. Don't worry about this. This is just two obvious sort of things that take place when you have a, a little seed that becomes a sprout. So the seven aspects of the cause are the seed, the sprout, the leaves, the stem, the cavity inside the stem, and the essential oil, the flowers, and the fruit. So this is presumably how in the old India you would you know, sort of, a, this is biology uh, 101 in the Indian context. This is what you have when you have something like this, this, um, this sprout. The earlier parts successively give rise to the later parts through the power of the perpetuating cause. So the perpetuating cause is essentially the, well, the perpetuating cause are the circumstances. So that's where you have the seed and then you have the conditions or secondary causes. I guess that's what they mean here with perpetuating cause. The 
um, the moisture, the quality of the soil, sunlight, etc. The six aspects of the conditions. Oh yeah. So the six aspects of the conditions are earth, water, fire, wind, space, and time. Essentially, the I think we can say the six elements and then also time. They provide respectively the support, the cohesion, the ripening, the growth, the accommodation, and what makes the stages of change possible. These conditions work together to help the plant grow from the stage of the sprout to the stage of the fruit. Now, this is just for us to identify, essentially, or essentially to refute the idea that things would just happen sort of without any rhyme or reason, they're just there. Or that we might think, oh, well, it was all created. It's also wonderful. It must be created by some greater being. And that's where we need to bring home the point things arise interdependently. So that's about outer phenomena. Inner interdependence. On the inner level of dependent arising, there are 12 aspects related to the cause. A sutra explains these, and this is the Salu, this Salu Sprout Sutra, the rice seedling. Interdependence is like this. Because this arises, sorry, because this exists, then that arises. Because this arose, then that arises. Conditioned by ignorance, there are formations. Conditioned by formations, there is consciousness. Conditioned by consciousness, there are name and form. Conditioned by name and form, there are the six sense sources. Conditioned by the six sense sources, there is contact. Conditioned by contact, there is feeling. Conditioned by feeling, there is longing. Conditioned by longing, there is grasping. Conditioned by grasping, there is becoming. Conditioned by becoming, there is birth. Conditioned by birth, then aging, death, anguish, lamentation, suffering, misery, and distress arise. This is how the aggregates of this whole great suffering arises. So these are the 12 links of dependent arising. And that is associated with the uh, original condition of samsara, which is ignorance. And that's where, on the basis of ignorance, we have this duality we think self other and the phenomena that we perceive as other also we perceive in terms of their existing in relationship as they uh, are constructed by the us as the perceiver where we then perceive particular objects and these exist in terms of location and in terms of time this is then where we could say relative truth begins and that's why on the basis of ignorance we then have this situation, which we could, which we essentially now refer to as the phenomenal world. What is implicit in the Buddha's teaching is that we're saying beyond the phenomenal world, there's there's an unconditional condition which, on the basis of us not recognizing this, we fixate on appearances as existing truly, and that's why we have this condition of avicca or ignorance that is the first link. And that's where we speak about how these links, they give rise to each other. Um, many of you would have come across um, the notion of the person that sits, the, what we call the Pratekya Buddha, or just simply a sage, sits in a cemetery with a bone and says, where, where does this come from? Well, it come from death. Where does death come from? Well, it came from, from birth. Where does birth come from? Well, it then comes about due to Becoming. And becoming, where does that come from? That comes due to grasping a hint. That's then the list that we've just gone through. So that's where the we the the sage then essentially establishes um the 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 way in which our existence comes about. So that's where it begins with this ignorance and on the basis of ignorance avijja then we have the formations the samskaras then there is consciousness then there's the various skandhas and then there are the ways in which we relate to our perceptions and so on so i think we're all familiar with that concept but that is what we then are discussing when we talk about the inner inter inner interdependence and the 12 links of dependent arising 
And so that then the sutta continues in relation to this, by ignorance ceasing, then formation cease. By formation ceasing, consciousness ceases. By consciousness ceasing, name and form cease. By name and force form ceasing, the six sense sources cease. By the six sense sources ceasing, contact ceases. By contact ceasing, feeling ceases. By feeling ceases, longing ceases. By longing ceasing, grasping ceases. By grasping ceasing, becoming ceases. By becoming ceasing, birth ceases. By birth ceasing, old age and death cease. By old age and death ceasing, then anguish, lamentation, suffering, misery, and distress cease. It is only in this way that the great aggregates of suffering cease. The, co the core of this message here is on the basis of us getting to the basis of ignorance. And if you're thinking, gosh, well, I don't know, do I want to just disappear into thin air? <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about dualistic perceptions. So our inability to essentially relate to reality is then the samsaric condition in which we, on the basis of, of ignorance, then construct a phenomenal world that is profoundly painful. And that's where we're not just talking about our existence. We're talking about our, you could say, shadow life or half life or not actually enjoying ourselves as is clear here on the basis of those 12 then what comes out of that is anguish lamentation etc so there's suffering that comes on the basis of that so this is where we are we're talking about we're talking about illness here and we're talking about essentially diagnosing how did this illness come about and then treating it so that's that's the purpose of understanding these 12 links so um but let me just, just very briefly, just as an aside, I just want to, there was, a, there was another sutra that we're going to talk about here, which is the Samdhi Niyamochana Sutra, which is just, the, these two sutras are translated actually really wonderful. So the, so if you go into, let's just see here. Yeah, you go into um, 84,000, you have something called the reading room, and then here you have the Salu Jangbei Do, yeah, it's just so beautiful. I just sort of wanted to essentially gush a bit over and just express my complete admiration for what's happened here. As, as you know, many of you, this is only over the last decade, really, uh, that this has emerged, this 84,000 project. And thank you, all of you who are supporting it. And here then, it's just beautifully presented with um, the Tibetan here, the English translation, the Sanskrit. And then also a really a, a, a really great way it's put up. You here we have then the the summary in this sutra at the request of Venerable Shariputra, the Bodhisattva Mahasattva Maitreya elucidates a very brief teaching on dependent arising that the Buddha had given earlier that day while gazing at a rice seedling. The text discusses outer and inner causation and its conditions, described in detail, describes in detail the twelvefold cycle by which Inner dependent arising gives rise to successive lives and explains how understanding the very nature of that process can lead to freedom from that um, cycle of, of, of suffering. So here then um, are then the reference to the venerable people who have been participating in the introduction, which is sort of more sort of an academic overview of the text, and then the translation. And um, like I said last time, I read a little bit of the opening um, section there. So just to let you know, there is such a thing as 84,000, and you don't want to miss it. All right. Meanwhile, back at the farm. So these 12 links conventionally arise since the latter links uh, exist owing to the existence of the former links. Because of the former ones arose, the latter links arise and function. If the former link does not exist and has not arisen, the latter link will not arise. The aggregates of suffering will cease if the previous link did not arise. So all of this comes down to what we call praticca samudpada, dependent arising. And this is significant on one hand in understanding the, the nature um, of our phenomenal existence and understanding how it is it exists dependently. And the implication is also because everything exists 
interdependently. There is not something that is, you could say, unconditional. And this is this spells out good news for us because it means that we're never stuck with one particular condition. Of course, we very often, Sansa Kinsumaja very often would say, you know, well, the good thing about the phenomena existing as they are is that, for example, negative circumstances are impermanent. So if we have negative circumstances, them being impermanent, it we will it things negative situations will pass. But of course, it's also implicit in that things that we attach ourselves to, they will also pass. So the whole thing is such that the nature of impermanence is, you know, something that we need to take into account. But what lies at the basis of impermanence is that phenomena are not fixed. And that's also where we can affect, you could say, desired objectives. Here we're talking about the desired of objectives of remedying the condition of ignorance that then cures us of all the, you could say, ensuing complications, the the 12 links. But it basically spells out that uh, any given situation being conditioned is workable. We can always create conditions. And of course, that's also what's implicit in the path that we create the conditions for the path in terms of merit. And on the basis of merit also, we can then pursue the project of wisdom insight into, say, for example, what we're doing here in the nature of of um, nature of the 12 links of dependent arising and so forth. So that's where the, 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 uh, the nature of dependent arising is really, really significant in terms of our practical engagement with, with our reality. So in terms of, in terms of their conditions, so we talk about the causes up there, and then we talk about in terms of the conditions, the links associated with the afflictions, such as ignorance arise with the assistance of perceived outer objects. This is where we begin to react, right? On the basis of ignorance, we have a sense of I, and then on the basis of I, then there's like I, these afflictions. Hey, do I want this? Do I not want that? So that's on the basis of what we're perceiving, we have these afflictions. So they then arise um, in terms of perceived out objects, the inner sense faculties, us perceiving it, being happy, not happy, and so on. It is similar for the links associated with karma and the seven links associated with suffering, such as name and form. So that's where the 12 links there are associated basically with, with uh, afflictions, with karma, and with suffering. I think I, I think I uploaded the notes from last time, but um, but anyway, we we just have this list here that little bit talks away about how the twelve links here they're associated respectively with afflictions, karma, and suffering. Okay, so on the inner level, on the inner level, the earth element is solidity. The water element is fluids. The fire element is heat. The wind element is the process of breathing, digesting, and so on. The space element is the openings and cavities of the body. And there is also the element of consciousness. So that's where we talk about these five elements, earth, water, fire, etc. the five elements, and also consciousness. And this is something where we can talk about this in terms of the outer phenomenal world, and that's typically how both in, you could say, in Indo-Tibetan and also in Chinese medicine and you could say out of physics, if you like, one speaks about these five elements. And then also here we add to the to this then the, the cognitive quality of consciousness. So these six elements act together as conditions to make things happen. For example, the visual consciousness arises through the mutual functioning of five factors. The eye's sense faculty is the support. A form is the perceived object. The object is visible, the space is unobstructed, and the mental attention is present. So that's where we have the support. What is it again? The, the uh, faculty, uh, sorry, the support, and then the object, the the perception of the object and the space being unobstructed, nothing gets in the way, and there is consciousness, awareness about this. These five factors should be adjusted to fit each other of the other sense consciousnesses. So that's where we understand when we have a particular perception, this takes place in terms of these, these five. 
very often we also just speak in terms of subject and object and sometimes we talk about the object the faculty and then the consciousness that's generated on the basis of that anyway in terms of consciousness a later moment of consciousness arises from the previous moments of consciousness as its perpetuating cause and so it appears continuous and that is essentially what happens to us in in our experience right now as we're sitting here we're thinking in terms of something we just heard when we're trying to make sense of it <laughs> and, and these are singular moments of consciousness that you could say that connect and link on to each other so that there's a cause from a previous moment of consciousness into a present moment of consciousness this actually touches on a really big topic because we essentially understand then consciousness as arising from consciousness and it would be difficult to to think of consciousness arising from anything else i don't know if any everybody in the room agrees with this but this stands in strong opposition to what we be we get fed in the general modern modern world outlook which is consciousness well that's something that originates from the brain isn't it it's physical isn't it it's just neurons firing and that's why we have to say well that is rather a leap of faith what we can however empirically verify is the fact that yes we we have a particular experience but previous exp our present experience is entirely caused on previous experience so consciousness by its very nature is intangible cannot be co come about due to physical causation and essentially it is something that the experience and content of consciousness is such, such that it's it comes about due to its um previous moments of consciousness of course we're not denying that there's a somatic co component of the whole relationship um, then with the physical embodiment but we just need to uh, appreciate the nature of consciousness and how present experience premised on previous moments of experience so here then or actually Sheryl Palton he says without the previous moment of consciousness as the perpetuating cause it would be impossible for consciousness to arise it cannot arise from matter that would be like a sprout coming from a stone or light coming from the darkness so that is this leap of faith that seems to be all the, the rage here in our <laughs> in materialist science as of quite a while anyway consciousness is defined as that which is clear and knowing that's the the cognitive quality that we possess yeah an example of the continuity of consciousness is the process of learning to read consciousness is seen to be an unbroken continuum in that the later moment of consciousness arises from the previous moment of consciousness if the assembled causes of consciousness remain complete at the time of death why would its continuity be cut it wouldn't because consciousness is not material and this is again where we have a stark contrast between the idea of clinical death as being the uh, extinction of consciousness and where we can understand that previous moments of consciousness this intangible quality is something that gives rise to further uh, experiences of consciousness which has nothing to do with the material so outwardly this sort of continuity is like the way a large river continues to flow or the way a sprout irreversibly arises when an undefective seed has all the necessary conditions of water manure warmth moisture and so on therefore since all outer and inner things need their own exact causes and conditions to be assembled if nothing suitable is lacking the thing will not arise on the other hand if the causes and conditions are complete then the thing will naturally arise through interdependence this continuity of cause and effect has functioned from beginning this time there's never been a creator such as an atman or an almighty god causes such as seeds do not think these are my own effects i gave rise to them you know and effects such as sprouts do not think i arose from that it's just a functioning of cause and effect that takes place on the basis of previous instances that leads on to the next 
again, this is entirely something that we can verify. Um, but this is also where we, the sort of metaphysical speculations, they they sort of have um, metaphysical exp uh, explanations such as a god, a creator, or even the idea that there's just sort of a meaningless, directionless, um, you could say, procedure taking place. Uh, essentially, we can see these are nothing but generated by by confused or you could say um but of course conditioned by you could say culture and particular belief systems but ultimately if we investigate doesn't really have much to do with reality if we if we um and this of course is what this whole book will be about if we begin to analyze and uh, validate our knowledge so five special features of cause and effect so Shiropatan says, there are five special features to the interdependence of cause and effect. As it is said, know that causes and effects are not eternal, not annihilated, and not transferred. Big effects can come from small causes, and effects are concordant with their causes. Okay, to explain this in detail then, for as long as the seed has not ceased, the sprout will not arise. Right. However, once the seas has seed, ceased, then the sprout will arise. This shows that they are not permanent. So that also, this is important because that's where we identify that the creator of something actually ceases as soon as the product has come about. Once the the seed, sorry, the sprout has come about, the seed, the seed ceases. Now, if the seed, then too, if the seed has ceased and the continuity is broken, the sprout will not arise. The ceasing of the, the, um, yeah, okay, if the seed is ceased or the, there's basically the seed is damaged, the sprout will not arise. The ceasing of the seed and the arising of the sprout are like the balance of arms of a scale going up, uh, going down on one side and up on the other with no interval between them, right? This shows that the continuity is not cut. So there's there's a cause, there's a particular moment of consciousness right now, there's right now there's flowers growing in your pots and what have you. All of these then indicate that there is this continuity. So unless there's something that, that is, you could say, corrupted or damaged, then the continuity is not cut. Three, the seed and sprout are two things. Their essence and function are not the same. So we can look at seed and sprout. Well, they're they're obviously different, and yet they come about due to this continuity. But it, this shows that there's no transference from the former to the latter. And this is also significant in us identifying how things don't possess inherent existence. There's not a, th a thing that carries on. There's a there's a particular there's the seed, and then that gives rise to the to the sprout. No, we we can't wax sentimental about it and say, oh, well, you know, there's still a bit of seed in you sprout, you know, as, yeah, but uh, in fact, it is really just causes and conditions. This also goes for us in, in our lives, you know, I mean, we impute particular names and identity on what in fact is something like that, that is continually evolving. Sometimes we're happy about that, sometimes we're not happy about that. But this is nevertheless something we can observe in terms of um, the whole phenomenal, phenomenal world. A small seed can produce a large fruit. This shows that a great result can be accomplished from a small cause. So this also we can observe both in the phenomenal world and you know in our own in our own experience. Little seeds can give rise to huge, gigantic trees, and sort of little, n sort of n little thoughts can sort of just, you know, bother us, and we can actually end up creating a big drama out of just a single little thought. In the same way that a wheat seed produces a wheat sprout, happiness comes from virtue. So there's a there's a continu continu continuum of similarity between a cause and effect. Yeah, so that's where also the point is we create positive, you could say, um, conditions and that creates happiness. So this is what we refer to as virtue that gives rise to happiness. This demonstrates 
Shira Pavan says that the the continue the continuum of similarity between a cause and its effect, or how an effect is concordant with its cause. So you might say, well, that's obvious, but this is this is how we need to know our reality. And again, it on one hand talks about how it's exactly this. There's no transference of something, and yet there's a continuum. There's a relationship um, between the cause and its effect in terms of there's a similarity. Pumpkin seeds don't give rise to apple sprouts and so forth. And likewise, also things don't just come about randomly. They all come about due to particular causes. So Shara Paldin says, we need to understand the functioning of cause and effect in these five ways on both the outer and inner level. More examples of these are extensively taught in the sutra connected with questions on what happens after death. So to conclude this discussion of the continuity of cause and effect, here is a quotation from the protector Nagarjuna's Essence of Interdependence. First from the root verse and then from his auto commentary. I think I've uploaded that. I think um, there's Mike Dickman, um, an Englishman living in Paris since decades, um, at least last time I checked, very, very nice uh, gentleman, and who's uh, translated this. So I think I have already uploaded in the resource folder uh, his translations of this little, this little text. So please have a look at that. Anyway, there Nagarjuna says, just like recitation, a butter lamp, a mirror, a seal, a magnifying lens, a seed, sour taste and sounds, the aggregates are linked, not transferred. This the wise should know. So this is where we can see how this, this continuity uh, creates particular causes without there necessarily being something transferred. So for example, here we are. A student learns how to recite prayers from a lama. So we we learn how to chant Hong Ujin Yukin Udan Sam. Yeah. <laughs> and and prayers like that. It's from hearing it. And that's where something is learned on the basis of us. There's a continuum between the cause and effect. And so but there's not an actual transference. There's actually, in this case of us nowadays, listening to, let's say, an MP3 recording. Well, that is just signals that create particular co uh, effects. But again, it's not random. It's definitely, there's a continuum, but there's not, the point here is they're linked, but they're not transferred. A butter lamp comes from butter and a stick, right? So for example, we would say, we take one, we take a, a, um, a butter lamp and we light it, and these, the causes and conditions are come from the butter, the stick, and the fire. But then, is if we light it, you know, these these are all conditions. That's there's um, the, the 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 fire that lights it. Is that the same or different? Well, it's we could say it's the same, but it's actually not. So and so forth. A reflection comes from a mirror. So there we say, oh. Gosh, is there anything? Am I actually in the mirror? And so forth. The raised imprint of a seal comes from clay. Fire comes from a lens, like if we have a magnifying glass. A sprout comes from a seed. Saliva emerges from a sour taste. You think lemon, right? And then you have this experience. An echo comes from sound. Like these examples, the aggregates are linked. The phenomena of the, the phenomenal world and the phenomena there are linked together, but the former do not transfer to the latter, and the latter do not arise without relying on the former. The wise should realize this. So this is significant in terms of us understanding reality, but it's not as if we're gonna discontinue referring to our you know, daughter as our daughter and saying, You're not the same. I <laughs> you know, we might do that, you know, or uh, you know friends and so forth the reality around us of course yes it, it's we we refer to it we label we impute it and so on but we have to understand it is in fact just a sequence of continual uh, causes and conditions and that's where there's not a transfer that also that is where <clears throat> we can understand impermanence and it also it's where we can understand the whole nature of how things change so 
see if they're okay. We're going to start a new section. We're going to get to four reasonings, which is the ways in which we understand the essentially the causal efficacy and dependency of uh, phenomena, how we validly can understand phenomena. So, um, so we're going to be looking at that. And um, before we do that, maybe I'll just see if there's any questions just in regard to the previous material. In a practical sense, can we stop the whole process if we only become aware part way through? And are there specific practices to snap out of delusion at each of the 12 steps? It's They don't necessarily come in that sequence. They can happen all the time. And um, the, the way of snapping out, well, that's we're onto it. If you're practicing the Buddhist teaching, you're onto it because essentially you're onto vipassana. You're onto the wisdom that sees the sees through the ignorance. So we're remedying the cause. The entire path is about, uh, you could say, interrupting this. Um, but of course, yes, there are ways in which we can snap out of it. Let's say, for example, we have craving. We crave uh, cheesecake. And that's where we realize that we're perpetuating a particular fixation on cheesecake on the, on the basis of memory and so forth. So there are various ways in which we snap out of that. We could think cheesecake is just not good for me or whatever it might be. But because they're dependently arisen, the basic, the bottom line of this is that everything is uh, can be remedied. So that's implicit in the whole, you could say, uh, nature of dependent arising. Everything can be remedied. So you have countless um, skillful means to snap out of these various conditions. So, um, so yes. Sometimes a moment, a moment of consciousness seems to to just come popping into existence out of emptiness. Well, if you're saying emptiness as if it was uncaused, then obviously we 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 have just said the opposite here. But yes, of course, but we would say then they'd come out due to a cause, yeah? Anyway, why do we need to purport continuity? That seems a bit of a fixation in itself. Well, not really. It's actually to remedy fixation because if it wasn't that we identified the causal process, then we would say things exist in an absolute sense. And that is when we fixate, it's because we're saying that we are, we are identifying and fixating on an identity. So understanding the causal nature of things is the remedy for fixation. And so it would be implicit that if all of a sudden you uh, think of, you know, cheesecake, sorry, uh, I don't know why that, I don't know why that popped into my mind, but I have been acquainted with cheesecakes in my life and they must have made an impression. And so it's not as if a phenomenon that for which there's absolutely no no cause whatsoever would ever come into uh, our mind. So we have to acknowledge that there might have been some particular prior condition that become is the reason for particular moments of consciousness. Yeah? I'm sure you agree with that. Don't you? Yeah? Okay. All right. So then the the next section here, I'll just begin a little bit on that. Overview of the four reasonings and reasonings of causal efficacy and dependence. And this again, this is about us becoming, you could say, knowledgeable participants in our experience. So we say second are the specific explanations of the first three reasonings divided into two parts. The, se the second, the, sorry, the reasonings of causal efficacy and dependency will be taught together and the reasoning of the nature will be taught separately. So we'll see about that. Anyway, the first of these, the reasoning of causal efficacy and dependency, also has two parts, what they are and what their purpose is. For the first of these, the root verses say, when the collection of causes is complete, it functions, it functions to produce an effect. Each and every effect depends on its own specific causes. Now, I would like to to, um, to to highlight when we're learning something like this or we're becoming acquainted to something like this it's a bit like for example we came across the four noble truths right and initially we say oh yeah the buddhists they say four noble truth 
But the moment that we begin to make friends and understand what is the Four Noble Truths about, it's actually a very profound and universal understanding of our experience, our reality, is that there's, in terms of experience, we have suffering. But it doesn't come about randomly. It comes about due to causes. It can be remedied. And hence, there's a, a, part, a, a course of remedy. There's the path. Now, when we, when we come across the Four Noble Truths, we're coming across something that obviously is illustrating and pointing to Buddhist teaching, but it's also something that we can see is entirely universal. It's basic to any condition in which we, we, we wish to have a cure, right? So we would say there's an illness, there's the cause of it. It can be, if it can be remedied, then there's a, a path to remedy it, right? So the universality of the Four Noble Truths becomes such that we can see it's something that is reflected in our experience all around. And when we come across something like these, for example, just we had the 12 links of dependent arising. This is not to say, well, the Buddhists, you know, or we say according to Buddhism, we say blah, 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 12 links and so on. Yeah, we it, it comes up in, in Buddhism, but it's something that we need to observe universally. It's also like we would say, according to the metric system, there are, you know, there's five kilometers to Malambimbi or whatever, you know. Well, we can just say there's five miles or five kilometers to Molombimbi, but to say that according to the metric system is a little bit sort of, yeah, it's true. And it's, you could say, with thanks to the people came up with that system. Great, sure. But it's something that we, we really, that has to do with the reality around us. It's about us understanding the reality that's playing out. So the 12 links are dependent arising. They're really just for us to, understand our reality the metric system is just for us to actually have a handle on how far to between a to b so everything that we are we're learning here we are learning as something uh, that should we should identify it within our lived experience and of course when we talk about these reasonings we talk about these because they're essential to the way that we begin to understand and classify things so it's not just like oh gosh now here comes the <laughs> the seven this is and the eight that's and now the four reasonings and so on it's not intended to be um you could say that it's yes it's dry in a sense that it's logical it's scientific it's it's factual and all of that you know you might not get, get hugely excited about it but it is very much part of validating our knowledge of relative truth and also understanding absolute truth so us on the path to enlightenment we want to appropriate knowledge of these things because they are very very valuable in terms of us having a clear understanding of um, the reality that we're situated within so um, i was just looking at these four you know and i was thinking how can we how can we uh, you could say see the um the nature of these, well, you know, for example, we have the principle, okay, here they are, right? The principle is causal efficacy, dependency, nature, establishing a proof. Okay, let's say Panadol. Let's say we have Panadol. We talk about Panadol or we talk about carrot juice or whatever, and we talk about that thinking, ah, Panadol helps headache. Carrot juice makes me feel good. Now, that's what we here are talking about, the causal efficacy. And that's how we identify, you could say, causally, uh, ca causal phenomena. Now, when we say about dependency, it's more about the composition. Ah, oh, yeah, carrots, you know, it's full of vitamin this and that, and Panadol likewise has various properties in it that are helpful. The principle of nature is can be seen from various angles in terms of it's something that cures us or in terms of it's helpful or, you know, whatever carrot juice, Panadol, whatever, you know, it's not bad for me, and these kind of things. And then we establish a proof. Okay, then we'd want to have the whole list of exactly what are the chemical compositions of carrot juice or Panadol, etc. But this all constitutes ways in which we essentially are relating to the phenomena around us. Panadol, carrot juice, you know, death and taxes, what have you, all of that. And so this is something that has, you could say, a role in terms of our perceptions. And that's where for us to also validate the nature of the path, then also this principle, which is something that you could say trans that trans translates from our ordinary experience 
into also understanding the validity of something like the path. So that's how we'd want to to um, relate to this as something that's relevant in terms of our experience. So, Serapalden, he says, before going into the specific explanations, we will look at the four reasonings in general. To begin with, what are the four reasonings? The Mahayana Sutra of the definitive explanation of intent states, and I actually got a little bit excited about that because this is some, something called the Samdhya Niyamochana Sutra. And again, this is a, an extraordinary sutra which has been translated actually by an American academic who teaches as, at ANU down in Canberra called John Powers. And it's translated as um, Wisdom of the Buddha. But it's also, and this I didn't know, was actually, actually recently been translated also in the 84,000. So that's also where you have this work translated in there. And if also if you look at the Rigpa Wiki, the sort of the structure of this sutra is is um, explained. But it is a sutra that that is um, significant in terms of it talks about these what we call about referred to as the three turnings of the wheel and quite a lot of discussion around the nature of wisdom. It's it's quite important also in terms of understanding our perceptions and hence it's very important in the context of the Yogacharya um, teachings. So it, so anyway, it's Samdhya Niyamochana, Gongpang Ejel, Kiddo. And in there then, it says, reasoning should be known to have four types. The reasoning of dependency, the reasoning of causal efficacy, the reasoning of valid proof, and the reasoning of the nature. The Shastra, the compendium of the Abhidharma, sorry, that's actually not, that's not part of the, that's not part of the quote. Here we go. Okay. And the compendium of the Abhidharma, Abhidharma Samuchaya, Nambal Kuntu. No. Where am I done? Okay. You're getting insight into the, you're looking under the hood here, what goes on. <laughs> the Shastra, the compendium of the Abhidharma states, while endeavoring in the authentic Dharma and investigating phenomena, if one asks how many types of reasoning are used for investigation, the answer is four. The reasoning of dependency, the reasoning of causal efficacy, the reasoning of val logical valid proof, and the reasoning of the nature. Okay. Okay, let's just call it a day here. So this will this is to be continued. I hope I hope some of you, if not all of you, have the book and have the opportunity to sort of um, just familiarize yourself with this. I would say presently the most important thing is first to really identify the value of this, the relevance, and of course then to really, um, I hope, appreciate the, the wealth that is implicit in the, the teachings that we're, we're looking at. Okay. Okay, here's that. These explanations have been liberating to hear. I remember my early Catholic upbringing, and although there were beautiful teachings. I lost confidence in my own intelligence. I mean, this stuff here um, is just simply great for mental health. <laughs> you got it. That's exactly. Thank you so much. This is very rewarding or gratifying, you know, for me that this is exactly what we. This is exactly it. This is good for mental health. It clarifies things. You know, we have sort of this aha moment where actually, oh yeah, this is how. It, this is this is very useful so yes thank you yeah so no other questions okay let me just let me just since there's no other question i'm just going to go over the just my notes here just for today because i it was just just a little bit about the samdhi Niyamochana sutra right um, and this again is from the 84,000, just where it, it, um, where there is the introduction to our overview of the summary of the sutra. So in unraveling the intent, which is then the, the title it has in 84,000, uh, the Buddha gives a systematic overview of the three great cycles of teachings. Now, 
pretty much all of you will come across these three turnings of the wheel, right? The first, second, and third turning of the wheel. The first being about the Four Noble Truths and so on. The second being about emptiness and the third being about Buddha nature. So, so there then the Buddha in this text refers to, uh, which he refers to in this text as the three Dharma wheels, yeah, the turning of the wheel, right? Tri Dharma Chakra. In the process of delineating the meaning of these doctrines, the Buddha unravels several difficult points regarding the ultimate and relative truth, the nature of reality, and the contemplative methods conducive to the attainment and complete perf perfect awakening. And he also explains what his intent was when he imparted teachings belonging to each of the three Dharma wheels. In, amb in unambiguous terms, the third wheel is proclaimed to be of definitive meaning. Through a series of dialogues with hearers, Ravakas and Bodhisattvas, the Buddha thus offers a complete and systematic teaching on the great vehicle, which he refers to as the single vehicle. And this is something that that um, both, this I have from the Rik, Rikpa <laughs> wiki, but both Tsongkhapa and also Jamgun Mipan Rinpoche, they're really big on the value of this, this text. And particularly Mipan Rinpoche, who's so... Uh, you could say keen, uh, compassionately keen, to make us understand the single intent of what we're doing on the Buddhist path. That within the insight, then all the qualities of liberation emerge, but not as, you could say, various, you know, piecing together uh, this and that, bringing all sorts of things together, but really just as a, a vehicle that celebrates this abiding innate um, quality of Buddha nature. But this, of course, is premised on there being the insight that is no longer delusional in terms of solidifying things. So that's where the insight into emptiness is so important. And that, again, is premised on providing all the causes and conditions, which is then facilitated by teachings such as the Four, the, the four Noble Truths. So sometimes when Tsongsa Kenzo Rinpoche has been wanting to talk about these three, he would quote, from the Prajnaparamita, this, this line that says, mind, there is no mind. The nature of mind is luminosity. So first, when we say mind, that's where we under, understand the role of mind. And that's where we talk about mind in that sense, the Four Noble Truths. But then also there is the, the insight into, well, there is no mind in terms of something that we can grasp objectively. and then it's essentially referring to the, the dualistic mind. But then the, the, the nature of, of appearance, the nature of experience is luminous. The nature of mind, the nature of mind is luminosity. While you could say, okay, I apologize for my Greek, but ontologically, there's, there's, there's no mind, but the phenomenology of experience is there. So we would say, yes, there's the, the, it's true, phenomena are empty, experience is empty, and yet it is experience, it's luminous. And that is the foundation for everything we talk about, both in terms of samsara and nirvana, all the confused projections of samsara and all the qualities of enlightenment uh, in, in the condition of awakening. And so, so in that sense, the three wheels are these three turnings of the three dharma wheels these are um, th these come up again and again in so many different contexts so um, you have this then in the 84000 and also here in, um, and also in, in john powers translation the wisdom of the buddha okay all right Let's see if there's any uh Yes, clarifies concepts. Yeah. Um, mm -mm. Good. F There's another person for whom this is good for their mental health. I'm glad. <laughs> indeed, indeed, the only thing that works for me says says a lot about ex Catholics. I want to. Okay. Well, hey, you're all welcome here. <laughs> there's a there's a safe haven for ex all sorts of things here. So, all right. Thank you very much. And we'll conclude at this point.
that okay? Through all our births, wherever we may be born, may we be endowed with the seven good qualities of the higher realms. As soon as we're born, may we meet with the Dharma and have the freedom to practice it properly. At that time, may we please the holy gurus and practice the Dharma throughout the day and night. Realizing the Dharma and accomplishing its essential meaning, may we cross the ocean of existence in that life. Thoroughly teaching the holy Dharma in this world, may we never tire of accomplishing the benefit of others. By this vast benefit of others, without partiality or bias, may all attain Buddhahood together. So, thank you.